Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Mind Body Music. I'm Ian Cusan, the Canadian Opera Company's composer in residence and your host for this evening. This is our first event in our new COC in Conversation series, which explores opera's most fascinating and pressing questions. Tonight, we're examining music's impact on our minds and bodies from both an artistic and scientific perspective. It is important at the beginning of our time together to remember where we are. The Canadian Opera Company is located in Toronto on land that is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. It is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, Métis, and settler peoples. And we share this land with gratitude and out of mutual respect. Now for a little bit of uh, event housekeeping, we will begin tonight with a panel discussion, which will be followed by a Q&A period. You're able to submit questions using the chat feature on YouTube Live, and I'd encourage everyone watching to begin asking your questions now. Uh, we're taking note of your submissions and we'll save them for the Q&A time. So don't be shy, let us know what you wanna hear about this evening, and we will get to as many as possible. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce all of tonight's very special guests. From the COC's Ensemble Studio Training Program, we have singer Jamie Groot. Jamie is in her second year with the program, and uh, COC fans may remember her from last season's Rosalka, where she, uh, where she performed the role of uh, one of the wood nymphs. Uh, and from the field of psychotherapy, we're joined by Dr. Sarah Rose Black. Sarah is an accredited music therapist and registered psychotherapist. She specializes in palliative care and uh, psychosocial oncology at both the Princess Margaret Cancer Center and Kensington Hospice in Toronto. She's also a pianist, vocalist, violinist, and music health educator. Welcome. And I'd also like to welcome Dr. Charles Lim. Thanks to this wonderful magic of digital events, he's joining us from California today. Welcome. Charles has a number of appointments at the University of California, San Francisco, in areas including neurosurgery, otology, neurotology, and skull base surgery. He's also director of the Douglas Grant Cochlear Implant Center, and he's a musician himself playing bass, saxophone, and piano. Welcome. Thank you. And finally, tonight we're joined by Dr. Swati Swaminathan. Swati is a postdoctoral fellow in the Brain and Mind Institute at the University of Western Ontario. And currently she is studying how music can cue autobiographical memory, even in dementia. She's also studying whether music listening interventions can have positive long-term impacts Dr. Swaminathan is also a singer in the Drupat style of North Indian classical music. Welcome. Thanks. So as you can tell, we have uh, an incredible set of minds joining us here tonight. And I wanted to start with the observation that I, I just made from reading your biographies. Um, not only are you deep thinkers in your areas of research and practice, but you all happen to be musicians. I uh, wonder if we could start tonight by maybe have it, having you tell us a little bit about that story, that journey. What is what is a meaningful memory or experience that you've had in music? And uh, maybe we can start with Dr. Swaminathan. Sure. Uh, before I begin, though, I just wanted to say that uh, I uh, I've only recently started learning. Drupad, uh, and before that, I've, I learned some Kayal, which is another form of uh, uh, North Indian classical music. Um, but just to say that I'm a baby where Drupad is concerned, I wouldn't call myself a singer of Drupad. Um, and uh, just in terms of some a meaningful experience with music that kind of got it all started was just, um, I think this was in the early 2000s, my dad has this vast collection of CDs and cassettes with, you know, uh, music from India, music from uh, outside India. I was, I was living in India then. 
and uh, and at that point, uh, you know, he uh, he wanted to convert the tapes and the CDs to uh, a digital format, and so he gave that to me as a task, and I sort of sat and I converted all of that, and that kind of had me listening to music in a very focused way, and that's what got things started, I think. Excellent, mm -hmm. amazing. Uh, thank you for that. Dr. Lim, how about yourself? Thank you, and you know, for me, my life has been an obsession with sound. I don't know how to put it any other way. From a very early age, I felt like maybe nothing mattered more to me other than people besides sound, and I didn't understand it, but it formed the basis, I think, for almost every decision I made after, which was when I went decided not to become a musician because I didn't feel that I had the talent to affect the world musically. But then once I got into medicine, realizing that I want to understand hearing. So I became a hearing specialist. And then I learned that in medicine, we knew nothing about music. And so I started to try to uh, delve into the inner workings of the musical mind. And so really my obsession with sound and how it is that something that's just a vibration in the air can change our lives, change our world, um, change the way we use, view ourselves. Um, to me, that's been everything. Amazing, wonderful. Um, Jamie, I wonder if you can take a stab at this one. Um, it's a hard question because, I mean, I've, I've dedicated my life thus far to music and the performance of music. And so there are so many moments that go into that. But I, I can remember very fondly um, when, I was a, when I was a small child, my mom singing to me before I went to bed. And, and later on, when my grandmother had Alzheimer's, being able to still make music with her when, when it seemed hard to connect with her in other ways. And, and even now, I think the most meaningful musical experiences are always when we feel like we really get to connect with our audience members and on a reciprocal sort of um, understanding as audience members when, um, when I can feel as affected. Um, I, I think those are the most meaningful moments. I think we respond to the human voice in a very particular way. And I don't know, I think we can all probably hear our mom's voice in our head. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, and Dr. Black, how about yourself? It's such a great question and such a tough question. Um, just echoing what Jamie said, I have never known life without music. And when I think back to meaningful experiences, I feel flooded with memories. But what stands out when you ask the question is the first time I heard Glenn Gould perform the Well-Tempered Clavier. And it was with my parents in our living room. And they said, sit down and listen to this and you know, just see where it lands. And I was so moved. I was a kid. And it would just blew my mind that someone could tell such vivid stories and such vivid Im imagery with the piano but you know in more recent years the moments i've had with patients at the bedside in music therapy also stand out as some of the most meaningful experiences i've ex i've encountered thank you for that I i'm struck by the the level of personal connection that a lot of your stories um have had in terms of these these meaningful moments either with family or with other people and also just with this sense of fashion, fascination with, uh, with sound. It's, it's, um, it's amazing to see how it has this transcending quality across people and across cultures and across, um, across nations and time, of course. Well, I, I'd like to start our conversation tonight by thinking sort of broadly about, about music and the mind, um, and to, specifically to consider the process of how we perceive music and how this even works. And Dr. Lim, I wonder if we can begin with you. Here's a, here's a simple question for you. Uh, what, what exactly happens in our brain when we listen to music? Maybe not a simple question. <laughs> sure, well keep in mind, long before music gets to the brain, it has to go through the ear. And so I think that there's an important process that's worth, sorry, process from your uh, uh, Toronto perspective. There's, I think, an important um, series of steps that we should probably understand and, and just discuss. So I always think of sound as the physical uh, vibrations in the air, but the musical experience is something that happens in the brain. And they're, they're different, but obviously related to one another. And if you think about how this vibration ultimately gets to our brains, if you don't think about how your eardrums work or how your inner ear works, you may almost take it for granted because it's so seamless and automatic. Yet, what has to happen is that the air vibrations put microscopic movements into your eardrum, which then sends small microscopic movements down three hearing bones, which then go into your inner ear. 
the inner ear, which is called the cochlea, is where an amazing transformation happens, where sound as vibration becomes electricity. And so another way to conceive of that is that acoustics only exists between the world and your inner ear. Beyond the inner ear, there is no acoustics. What your brain is hearing is not vibrations. It's now responding to electricity. And so the electricity then goes up the auditory nerve from the, from the inner ear, where it then goes into the brain stem and then goes up to the higher brain centers where you ultimately perceive it as a musical experience or a musical sound. And that process is true for any hearing, but for music, which is a very, I think, profound and potent form of sound, to me, it's the highest form of hearing. It's the version of sound that really robustly activates the entire brain. And I think maybe um, ways that we will hopefully one day discover, because I think the, the power of music is something that we're just beginning to understand hmm. from a science perspective. So you say that that all or many areas of the brain are activated. How 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 does the brain look differently on a neurological level when, say, someone's hearing words or spoken text versus when they're hearing that musical sound? Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. So I, I think that first of all, it's important to know that the brain has an organization. It has a structural organization. So if you actually look at the brain, it's not just a blob of neurons that just sort of randomly activate. It's separated into regions. And these regions tend to have functional specialization. So for example, there is a region in the back of your head that handles most visual information. So if you were to see something and process that information visually, that part of your brain tends to be active. Now, something like language, which is a very robust stimulus from a sound perspective, stimulates primarily auditory cortex, which is the part of your brain that first handles sound. It's in the temporal lobes, sort of on the side up here. But then it also triggers what's known as language processing areas. There's sort of ancillary uh, regions in the frontal lobes that have to do with consciousness and memory that are sort of devoted for language and also areas slightly further to the back in the parietal cortex that are involved with meaning of, of sounds and interpretation. And so these are things that allow you to actually speak. But when you do a brain scan, for example, of somebody listening to speech or speaking themselves, those are the areas of the brain that are active. Music doesn't just do that. It's a very robust thing. You'll have visual, motor, cerebellar, memory, emotion. Like every region of the brain is potentially robustly activated through music. And so this is why I say it's such a potent form of sound. Beautiful. Amazing. Uh, Dr. Swaminathan, I wonder if you might uh, be able to reflect on, I hear, we hear these adages as um, music is the language of the soul or music is the language of love. Um, in what ways, and, and Dr. Lim already began touching on it, uh, in what ways can music be compared to language? Um, I mean, one way is metaphorically. Uh, and um, I mean, it, it seems that uh, music is really good at communicating some things while language is good at communicating uh, many other things. Uh, like if you're trying to give semantic details, so something about, you know, uh, you're trying to give uh, information about facts, language would be better than music, obviously. But music is, seems to be very effective at communicating emotion. Uh, and, and, and in some sense, so music tends to become associated with certain memories. So the exercise that you got us uh, started with uh, was really an exercise in bringing up uh, you know, a memory that we associate with music. Um, and because music bec is, is evocative of memories as well as emotion. You know, it's, it's a really strong uh, and rewarding uh, sort of uh, signal uh, compared to, to language. And, and, and it can be useful in different sort of situations than language, yeah. Yeah, and it, uh, rewarding, I think of the word pleasure. Um, how does pleasure come to play in this? Um, is it possible to hear pleasurable music and then not pleasurable music? And what 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 goes on with us? And how do we have those responses? Yeah, um, I mean that's a really great question, uh, and I'm not sure I'll be able to give you the uh, you know an answer as such. But it's it's a question that we grapple with sort of every day when we're trying to study music and uh, reward and pleasure and you know how it relates to other uh, aspects of the mind. Um, but 
you know, one of the, the things is, one of the interesting things is that people can listen to music that sounds really sad, but derive a lot of pleasure from it. And in fact, a lot of people feel chills or goosebumps in, in response to particularly sad sounding pieces uh, compared to, you know, uh, happy sounding pieces or something like that. So, um, so there is, there isn't this one-to-one -one connection uh, between, you know, the cues. Uh, so something that's fast tempo is generally thought to be happy, uh, but that doesn't necessarily correlate very well with pleasure and reward. Um, and I think it's, it's a very complicated sort of picture there uh, in the sense that it's related to so many different mechanisms, uh, like, you know, the memories that you associate with it or uh, just, you know, the context in which you're listening to something or the, you know, uh, just a lot of a lot of different things that we're st still discovering about uh, pleasure in response to music. Great. Uh, Jamie, I wonder if we can turn to you for a moment. Um, I want to think for a moment about uh, music and the body and specifically how your musical practice and, and your body uh, are combined together and intersect. I have been able to watch um, some of the training that you get to do as a member of the ensemble uh, studio at the Canadian Opera Company. And some of this training is, is quite rigorous in the sense that um, you might be in a room and with you are um, music trainers, you might have a diction coach, you might have a director, you might have a movement coach who is, uh, they're all offering you different um, different things. And they're kind of throwing it all at you at once. And I, I don't know about you, but I sitting in that room almost want to panic because it's too much information. <laughs> and yet I've seen you, um, <laughs> I've seen you thrive in these moments, but, what I think about that kind of training is, is it makes me think of almost like an elite athlete uh, who is training uh, rather than a kind of the idea of the artist who just kind of opens their mouth and wonderful things come out. So having said all that, um, what talk about the, the physical nature of the training that you do and or the performing that you, you do as a singer? Well, it's kind of a multifaceted question. I think first I need to say that as far as my experience in falling into opera, um, I really did fall into it. I, I loved singing. I, I sang quite a bit um, growing up and I went to an arts high school and, and was very happy to find myself singing classical music. But for me, I didn't know the art form before I was making it. Um, and so I would say I really did fall in love with the physical experience of making this type of music. Um, as far as my my training goes, I always think of us as um, working to remove layers um, because I think a lot of what we're doing is taking away um, tensions and um, filters that we've placed upon ourselves as we go through our lives to really allow the most genuine human experience in front of an audience. And so a lot of that is all about freeing up. I, I mean, there's, there's lots of physical um, work that gets done. I mean, we work lots with Jennifer Swan, for instance, on on our, our breath work and making sure the body has the strength and facility to really um, meet the demands of what we're asking of our, our very precious uh, little instrument. Um, but I think it's the training is, is often more about becoming more genuine and letting more of our own human experiences out in our music and finding um, ways to be able to have the facility to d follow our instincts and make the most of all the art we have in our heads. I think the hardest part as a young singer is knowing what you want to sound like and, and really having um, an intellectual experience of the music without being able to make it yet, without your body being behind it and without, I guess, I guess just waiting to grow. Um, and I think at, at the stage some of us are at in the ensemble studio, we're starting to feel like our bodies can support us enough that we can now make the art that we've always felt. Um, and I think that most of us, our goals are, are really to connect with audiences in a human way. And so, and as I, so as I said, I, I, I really think that all of that time um, is really spent removing layers. I think we're already enough as people. We know how to communicate. 
And and can you tell us just? I mean, we I mentioned that you you were in uh, last year's production of Rizalka. What what is it like to well, what is it like to get on the stage? Um, your body was uh, that was a production that was very physical. Yes. Um, and you're you're also having to produce beautiful sounds. I mean, that's one of the hallmarks of opera: beautiful sound, um, very engaged staging. And what what does it take to get to that place to get up? Uh, that evening to perform, and what does it feel like afterward? <laughs> um, well, I think it, it all comes down to practicing. I mean, a lot of the the first rehearsal when we saw all the physical movements we were going to be doing, um, it was concerning <laughs> to see that to uh, for us to realize um, we were going to have to do all of this at the same time. But I think it really comes down to muscle memory. So the whole point of um, or one of the points of us practicing is so that when we're on the stage we don't have to think about our technique anymore we don't have to think about oh did like was that breath enough all, all of the million things that go through our heads at that point we hope it's really just expression and i think that i'm it's an incredible experience to stand on the stage in front of so many faces it, it helps that there's a pit in between us and i can create some distance so i'm not quite so nervous but i uh it feels it feels like an amazing accomplishment. I mean, when else do you have just the viewership to connect with so many people? Um, I think I think it's amazing, and I and I think that the ability to give your audience a moment to escape into the world that I get to live in when I do my job is it's really powerful. Even if you don't think about anything else, if you just join us for a moment, um, that, it's just an incredible feeling. Well, we've talked about this idea of connecting with people, and and I'd like us to move to to talking about music and emotion. Um, of course, what would a what would a discussion on music be if we didn't actually listen to some? So I have prepared a couple of little, very brief clips for us to hear, um, and we're going to listen to the first one now, and then we'll come back and talk about that in a few moments. <laughs> Some of our, our listeners probably will recognize this. Uh, it is the final moment, the final two minutes of uh, Puccini's opera La Boheme, uh, where Rodolfo cries out this guttural cry for his lover Mimi, who has just died. Um, one thing I observe from this is it is incredibly emotive moment uh, in musically with the swelling of the strings, and I have a question for, for you, Dr. Black. How, how, is, how is it that we experience such deep emotion when listening to some, some music? This is a great question. And I think there is no one clear answer. I think it's, there's so much we don't know, but I would argue that it lands in so many different aspects of our experience. It lands physically, we hear it, we're taking it in the way Dr. Lim spoke about the actual physicality of what we process in our bodies. But we also have association. We may be moved by the actual musical line, like you mentioned, the swell and maybe the tension and release. Our bodies are actually quite musical. Like as um, structural elements of our bodies actually respond to music because they are music. We have a heartbeat that uh, functions as a drum, for example. So when we hear or experience, whether in a recording or live, um, these musical swells, these tensions, these releases, it, it effectively carries us with it. So there is actually a physical component, but if someone has a, a deeply rooted association with that uh, particular Puccini moment, or if you're sitting in the opera and you're, you're feeling the, the depth of emotion that the character is feeling, you're right there with them. And in, in the way that, um, that Dr. Swathi was talking about, music can say what words maybe cannot on their own. So there are just so many layers. There's the emotional, the physical, 
um, and to some extent the spiritual. When we are entranced by something that is powerful and that is artistic, um, we may we may have experiences that we can't quite put into words. They may be so powerful and beautiful for reasons that we may not be able to describe. There is something also profound about experiencing it in an opera hall with thousands of other people or experiencing it in the solitude or the quiet of our own, um, perhaps our own rooms or our own moments that are just ours and nobody else's. That can be deeply meaningful. But I would argue there's just so many layers of reasons why we respond with such depth of emotion. And it's I, I listening to that clip, I then start as a composer, start to think, okay, wow, so what is happening? Well, he has the tenor who is known for these upper register parts of his voice singing right at the top. And it almost it almost sounds like he's screaming. Um, it's a it's a true cry represented musically. And uh, and of course we if within the context of the opera we're hearing themes recurring that we've heard with other associations like you say that we might have. And of course we have the benefit of the story with the text being married to music. So there's so many pieces coming together like you say. That's great. Well this is the most performed opera, and, and this is why I, I chose a little excerpt from it. Um, audiences love it. And I mean, I would consider myself one of the audience members who love it because it's just a, I would say a perfect opera, um, but we go time and time again. And uh, Dr. Lim, I wanted to ask you next a question about why we're so drawn back often to these musical experiences. And this may be unfair to say, and correct me if, if I'm getting this wrong, but could we say that there is, um, that music has an addictive quality to it? You're asking some big questions, Ian. Uh, it's going to be hard for me to get this in quickly, but let me try. Um, of, of course, we can say that music has addictive quality because we know that the brain likes patterns. And I think that it is, music is maybe the ultimate form of pattern sound. And so I think the difference between music and real noise is that noise tends not to have patterns, whether it's in spectral frequency or time, whereas music is this highly organized um, version of sound. Now, um, when you think about the reward systems of the brain, which we talked a little bit about earlier, it's quite clear that, you know, we all know that things like, like sex and drugs stimulates these deep primitive reward centers of the brain, but they're subcortical, they're very animal parts of the brain. And actually music also stimulates these same regions. Um, you know, the nucleus accumbens, the ventral tegmental area, these are reward regions that are very directly stimulated by music that we love. And that feeling is addictive. Now there's also something, I think a lot of other layers that, that build on top of that. One is that we tend, for, for sound that we, for music that we're familiar with, that we have an expectation of, it holds a different kind of value to us than music that is unfamiliar to us. Um, in some ways, the reward value of something that is familiar is heightened. And a lot of that is based on music expectancies because you know that there's going to be a certain uh, reward moment in the music that to you is meaningful and you can kind of wait for that and expect it. But on the other hand, there's also the, the thing that we see in jazz, which is that you've never heard this before. It's the sound of surprise, something that's totally new to you that you can react in another way, which is the pleasure of the unexpected. And each of these things, I think, poses its own form of musical rewards to us. It's also interesting to note that the auditory system and the brain has inherent responses to things that are consonant versus dissonant, right? And so if you just look at intervals um, that have different harmonic relationships to one another, the consonant ones will tend to um, stimulate pleasure centers of the brain. And if you take a melody and you, um, this is work that was done by uh, Robert Zatori and Anne Blood in, in Canada, uh, and you, you add to it increasingly dissonant chords and you make the chord accompaniment, you know, harsher and harsher with respect to consonants, it becomes increasingly dissonant. You see parts of the brain that are, uh, they're called limbic areas of the brain, no relationship to me. Uh, these are subcortical parts of the brain that are very responsible for deep emotion. Um, uh, like I said, again, very primitive areas of the brain. These are stimulated by dissonance. And so you kind of layer all this together. You've got this combination of longstanding musical memories and associations based on your life. You have this biological tendency to react to certain structural elements of sound in a certain way. 
And then you've got these reward centers of the brain that keep us alive. They're the animal parts of our brain that really keep us um, alive and motivate us to avoid certain things in the case of reverse, aversive stimulations or to go towards them in the case of things that we love and in the case of music, which can certainly be addictive in its own way. You know, I find myself thinking, listening to your response and thinking as a composer, these are some of the tools, I would call them tools that are available to us in terms of surprise and anticipation and familiarity and repetition and um, it, it, that, that are used to structure a musical composition um, with the aim of having some kind of effect on, on an audience member. And it's funny to do it from the perspective of not necessarily knowing what that effect might be, but that it, it would create a sense of longing or a sense of um, arrival or a sense of sat satisfaction. Um, I want to stick with you for uh, just one more moment and um, and move on to thinking a little bit about memory and, and how uh, music and memory uh, relate. So why is it that when we hear or when we think of um, uh, of, a, of a text like lyrics of a song, um, we seem to remember those lyrics more easily, say, than just if we were reading a poem or memorizing a poem? That what is the association with text and music that kind of somehow makes it stick? Sure, you know, I think that it's also worth pointing out that music does not need science to the music, right? And so, you know, music has been around forever. I mean, all, all throughout human history, all cultures have always had music. And the scientific examination of music is a relatively recent thing. And so it's interesting from the perspective of a composer who just uses your own musical knowledge and um, artistic um, motivation to come up with a sort of musical feature. That to me uh, does not require any science to augment it. What science is hopefully trying to do is shed some light on these universal human experiences that we all have, whether it's listening to music or creating music, so that we can, I think, take it out of the realm of the abstract or mystical or the unexplainable and start to figure out how it is that our brain does these things so that we might be able to use music, first of all, understand it in a more accurate way, but also use music in a more powerful way um, to, I think, for me, maybe un unleash the potential of human creativity. Hopefully this is a topic we can come to later on. Um, now with respect to memory, there are important memory mechanisms uh, in our brain for, you know, in, in a way it's like your brain is sort of like a tape recorder, but there are some things that get encoded or embedded much more uh, firmly, much more deeply. These are emotions that usually you have to kind of link the, um, the, the occasion or the event to some deep emotional thing. And Music has the capacity to, to act as one of those kind of um, co-varying cues that when you hear that, all of a sudden it's like a tape recorder. You know, if, right now, if I ask you to play back one of your favorite recordings in your head, you could do it almost perfectly without any actual music in the room. That's how good your musical memory is. And it's actually a very interesting thing that if you were to Think about a musical memory you have. So for example, a song that that always reminds you of the summer of seventh grade, that kind of thing. That is actually embedded in a part of your brain. So when you, when you hear a, a song that has autobiographical significance for you, there's a portion of your memory in what's called the default systems of the brain, the medial prefrontal cortex of the brain and the front part of the brain that tends to be active in these sort of musical memories. And so in the same way that you can get an earworm, which is, you know, a hook, music that you kind of can't let go of. I think that our, because our brains are very good at remembering patterns of pitches, and when you tie them, you, you sync them to words, it embeds more deeply the memory of that pattern of words. Mm -hmm. And if you extrapolate that to music and to songs and to emotional events that happen when you're listening to the music, it all explains why a song that you heard when you were a kid stays with you for your entire life. And how when you're an adult and maybe your memory is failing, using that music might be a way to retrieve some of those lost portions of your memory. Well, I wanna pick up on that. Um, and Dr. Swaminathan, I'm, I know you've done quite a bit of work uh, in the area of um, music and its effects on, on patients who suffer from dementia. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that kind of work and, um, and some of the, the learnings from that, that area. 
So, um, I mean, this is this is still ongoing work, and um, uh, we don't have results yet. But I can tell you what we're doing and why we're doing it. Uh, so there's there's just a lot of anecdotal evidence about uh, how music seems to and a lot of arts in general seem to cue these spared sort of uh, you know cognitive abilities uh, in people with dementia um, and you know people with experiencing cognitive decline uh, late in life uh, and I mean anecdotally. Uh, there's, there's just a lot of that there. And uh, this sort of area of work is still kind of new in the sense that there are just a few groups of people who are working in this area. There's a group in Australia, uh, a bunch of people in the US and uh, the UK who are also working on these kinds of questions and a group in, in, in Europe. Um, and it's, it's clear that music is is able to evoke autobiographical memories uh, better than, you know, sometimes pictures from some a person's life, or sometimes, uh, and definitely better than silence or in, you know, the presence of noise or something like that. Um, and what is less clear is just the the mechanism by which we're able to access uh, these spared sort of cognitive reserves in people with uh, dementia, uh, and so. There are a few hypotheses that uh, we're looking at. So one of them has to do with uh, this idea of reward and sort of music, especially familiar music, uh, being very rewarding uh, in some way uh, that might cue autobiographical memory, uh, or it might just improve cognition in general, because when you feel better, you kind of do better on uh, you know, cognitive tasks and things like that. Another possibility is that it's it's related to a very personal memory. Uh, you know, it's directly related in some way to a personal memory, uh, maybe a person uh, from a particular time. And what we also know is that we tend to remember music as we do a lot of uh, uh, different things, but especially music from our teenage years. So these are really identity formative years. Uh, so years. Uh, where we're kind of experimenting with our identity, trying to figure out who we are. And we tend to have, uh, we tend to do that by trying different pieces of music, different genres of music and figuring out what we like, who we want to hang out with based on the music they listen to. And so music from this particular period seems to be especially well remembered and also uh, related to uh, preferences and identity. And so we're, we're trying to see if that might also be uh, a way by which, uh, you know, uh, some music, especially from the teenage years, could be especially uh, uh, likely to trigger autobiographical memories. It's incredible. Um, I, I, I'd love to, to kind of continue this conversation by thinking um, about the therapeutic applications of music. And um, now, Dr. Black, I'm sure, and I feel almost um, rude to ask you this because you're probably asked this every day. Could you tell us what, what exactly is a music therapist? Uh, you are a music therapist. What, what, does, what is that and what do you do? Such an important question, happy to answer it. Um, and I do get it often, but I think it's it's so vital. And the answer is big um, in terms of the scope of practice of a music therapist, in terms of the clinical populations we work with. But the heart of what music therapy is, is the use of music by a trained professional, a music therapist, to achieve some kind of clinical goal. And so in my work, I work in cancer care, psychosocial oncology, and a lot of palliative and end of life care. So I'm using music intentionally with the purpose of achieving some kind of therapeutic goal. So that might be an emotional catharsis, that might be anxiety reduction, that might be pain and symptom management, that might be legacy work and creating um, songs that are um, newly created. So original songwriting by the patient for their family so that when they die, the family has a song written by that patient, regardless of the patient's musical abilities. Nobody has to have any musical experience to participate in music therapy. But again, circling back, what does a music therapist do? They might um, use music in a whole bunch of different ways, essentially to develop a therapeutic relationship, 
and from that springboard achieve some kind of therapeutic outcome. But we work in uh, schools, we work in private practice, we work in correctional facilities and mental health and addiction. We work in um, pediatrics, in the NICU, in palliative care units and hospices. There really is no limit to where music can have an impact. The music therapists tend to choose their preferred patient population, train specifically in that, and then develop their own tools, assessments, based on some really excellent evidence-based literature that informs our practice. Incredible. So is it possible that, uh, that a patient could be prescribed um, music as it, like they might be prescribed a drug or a medication? So the short answer is yes. And the long answer is that I tend to be very careful when I make suggestions if patients ask me, you know, what should I listen to? Ultimately, the music that is the most relevant to that patient is going to be the most therapeutic. So there really is no one size fits all. It depends on who the patient is, what their history is, their background, what the role of music in their life is and has historically been. So when I go in and I'm working with a patient, I'm looking at the whole person, as much of their history as I can um, assess or get to know, and we develop a rapport. So I'm using live music 95% of the time. There are occasions where someone wants to hear a specific performance. Like I'm not gonna recreate Glenn Gould, I'm not gonna recreate a symphony or an opera. But most of the time it is in fact that I am adapting to that patient's specific needs in a specific moment using live music at the bedside. However, I will create curated playlists with a patient if they say, you know, I have to go in for this procedure that feels really scary, um, but I'm told I can listen to music. So can we map out some music for me to listen to? So I will then unpack, well, what feels scary about it? And what music do you turn to when you feel anxious? And we'll do a bit more of an, a deep dive into what matters to that person. But I'll just add that it's lovely that the teams I work with at the hospital will effectively refer to me in tandem with pain and, uh, pain medication. So we're prescribing these opioids. We'd also like music therapy to follow up. So the short answer is yes. Wow. And and what kind of physical effects uh, does does this kind of work have? What what how how can the body respond to music? Can you give us an overview of the, of some of that? Definitely, definitely. It's remarkable. Often when I start to play, so if you imagine me wheeling my keyboard in to a patient's room, and they tell me that they are uh, feeling a lot of pain in different parts of their bodies, and the medicine hasn't kicked in yet, or isn't as effective as they would have hoped. I start to play very intentionally, very specific music, depending on the patient's needs. And I watch the brow unfurl and I watch the shoulders drop. And perhaps I watch the breathing deepen. This does not necessarily happen every time like clockwork. It sometimes takes um, a lot of different trial and error, but ultimately I notice that people have physical uh, relaxation. That's, that's a very typical response when they have live music presented in a certain way. But by the same token, uh, it can be a very physical response to start to cry. The music might just be so emotional that they have a physical, um, emotional response as well. Um, people fall asleep. And I always joke with my patients, they'll apologize and say, oh, I'm so sorry I fell asleep. And I'll say, no, no, that's actually great. <laughs> in this particular musical experience, if you fall asleep, it's a compliment. Um, I, I will actually curate the music intentionally and change the tempo of the music to support them in falling asleep if they tell me that's what they wanna do. But if they're dealing with something like nausea, um, the music can function as a distraction and a diversion from the focus on the symptom. I'm not necessarily changing what's going on physiologically. We don't know enough about what music does quite yet to get that far, we know a little bit. But if someone's not quite as focused on their the achiness or on the tension or on the nausea, perhaps that gives them a little bit of a mental break, which then helps relax their body. Incredible work. Um, I, I promised that I would play uh, a couple of clips and I want to, to play another one of those now. Um, we're going to listen to a short clip and we're gonna come back and chat some more.
Uh, I wish we could listen to more of this amazing music. Um, I, I, I didn't answer the question that I posed to our panelists earlier about important, meaningful musical moments in my own life. Um, but this uh, was actually a record that was given to me as a child or that I listened to as, as a young person. Um, it's from, uh, it's called Mystère des Voix Bulgares. It's a collection of Bulgarian uh, women's choir uh, music. And um, I remember encountering this as a young person and, and having such deep feeling and not knowing at all what what was being sung, what the, the text was, but thinking um, the, 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 the tone or the tone quality of the singing was, it did something to me. Um, and Dr. Swaminathan, I, want, I wanted to think for a moment, we've, we've already mentioned how uh, music is something that is cross-cultural. We see it all over the place, but in particular, um, music that is created together um, it, it, through social music making, whether it be choirs or choral music. Why, why is it that we come, come together around music? Why is it that we make music together? Um, I think this is a, I mean, this is a really great question that uh, uh, a lot of people have been puzzling over uh, because uh, I think as Dr. Lim mentioned, every single culture and subculture even of uh, in the world uh, has a musical sort of uh, idiom of its own, a musical style, uh, maybe musical philosophies of their own. Um, and so there's something about music that is very social uh, and something that is universal in that sense as well, because it's everywhere. Um, and, uh, and, 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 so in some contexts, especially in classical music contexts, uh, the performer and the audience tend to be different people. But in other kinds of musical cultures, the performer and the audience are, I mean, they're not separate. Everybody's engaging in it. Everybody's maybe making music. Everybody's dancing. Um, so uh, there's something especially about the rhythmic quality of music, especially music uh, that has a groove, that's something that you can tap along to, um, that seems to be uh, especially good at, uh, you know, getting people to synchronize, uh, particularly with a beat and therefore with each other. Uh, and so there could be something about that uh, that could be related to why, uh, you know, music is related to social cohesion. Uh, another thing that I keep thinking about is just work songs. Um, so there are these these songs with a very regular beat uh, that are usually done for, you know, that people may engage in while they're doing rep repetitive work. And that makes the work less repetitive or just less monotonous, uh, but also kind of has them synchronizing and getting things done. Um, and the other thing, thing I want to, I'm, I'm thinking about is just the lyrics in music. So there's lyrics as well as sort of the instrumental part, like without the, the lyrics. And the lyrics could also have, uh, you know, play a big role here in social cohesion. Um, and I'm thinking about protest music, which seems to be, you know, uh, in every, everywhere around the world, wherever there's a protest, there's usually music that goes along with it. And it seems to be good at organizing people and keeping people motivated and keeping people engaged in the protest. Uh, and, you know, just motivated to continue sticking uh, to the to what their uh, goals were. So there's something about uh, uh, music definitely that seems to produce social cohesion and, and it might have something to do with the rhythmic quality as well as the repetitive quality mm. of uh, music. It's it's amazing. You, you mentioned work songs, and my family is is descended from voyageurs who would uh, travel waterways in canoes, and would often be sixteen hour days of canoeing, if you can imagine. I can't imagine, and with you know black flies everywhere around us, and they would sing these songs, and it would both 
uh, keep the rhythm of the paddle stroke, but it would also be a way of recounting and telling extended narrative stories. So it was a, mm -hmm. a way of kind of maintaining culture, maintaining unity as a team, and probably staving off some boredom as well, I can imagine. And and uh, I'm thinking back to what Dr. Black was saying about um, about the spiritual function of music in terms of um, the, the singing that happens together and also the music making in those contexts. Mm -hmm. So much to be said here. Um, I'm wondering if we can move briefly to uh, to the the another enormous topic of music and creativity. Um, so uh, this, as a again, I mentioned I'm, I'm a composer. Um, often I will encounter moments where uh, where I enter what I would describe as a flow. Um, so. Ideas are sort of forming in my mind, musical ideas. They're linking to other ones. I lose awareness of the sense of, of, of how much time has gone by um, in, in my composing. I sort of liken this to driving down a long stretch of road and forgetting for 10 minutes, like, how was I driving this car and not crashing it sort of thing. Jamie, I, I wonder, um, well, first of all, many many people don't know this about you, but you're multi-creative. Oh, it is. <laughs> it's true. Uh, you're an excellent singer, of course, um, but you're also a wonderful visual artist. And I was wondering if if you ever either have this experience in either of those practices of, of entering a flow, a kind of uh, pattern of creating this work, and do you ever, if, if this is true, do you, do you notice a difference between when you're singing and entering that flow or when you're uh, creating your, your visual art? That's an excellent question, Mr. Ian. I, um, I, the, sh the short answer is yes, absolutely. I would say for me, my visual art is largely um, intensely observational. I would say I love, I love realism. I love the unbiased, um, sort of perspective of trying to recreate my impression of something. And so in that, I think there, there's a flow that comes from once the groundwork is laid and now I can add all of my shading and later layering and all of those things to create, um, to create something that I feel um, expresses what I see. However, in, in the music side of things, there's an element of, uh, it's, I don't know how to put it into words. It's, it's such an internal experience for me of, of being able to, first of all, understand the composer's intentions. And so largely that comes from character work. And, and once the music and, and character are one in the same to me, so that means that I have learned all the music, my translations are as, um, as memorized as, as the text, my, uh, the context of the opera is incredibly clear to me. Um, everything technically is is sitting where I would like it to, and I and I do break my practice into multi, um, many different areas, um, and so that is one type of practice. Um, another type of practice is to really look at the um, the character's experience and understand why did the composer set it this way so that it expresses the emotion of this moment. And the truth of the matter is once I can get into that space, so once I feel like the music is a part of me as a human, there's a certain naturalness that comes from that. And I think that the great, some of the greatest composers understand the progression of, of the human experience. Mm -hmm. I can feel an emotion building inside of me and then the intense release of it. I can, I can see why all of those little tenuto markings and the crescendo and the swell of this phrase is important because it is all of a sudden integral to me as a human and as a character. Um, and I think that like, that's where that flow comes. I think, I think once the character becomes human and the music therefore becomes human, there's, there's an, just an intense instinct that, that goes with that. And, and that go, that's sort of what I was saying before. I mean, all of our training is hopefully getting us to a point where we have all of the tools to really let our instincts um, free. Um, and I think once you're able to get to that vulnerable place, there's an incredible flow. I mean, you don't think about what you do as you walk through life, you just do it. It, it, it makes total sense to you for a billion reasons. And I think the same can be said of a really great story. You can see where it's going, you can feel where it needs to go. Um, 
that's a that's a long way of saying yes absolutely and absolutely yes and interesting to see how there is like a difference in time, like in the, in the creating, like for example, in shading, if you're doing visual art, that's when you can enter this kind of flow. But it's, it's also at a certain point in the singing, once certain technical elements, memorization, character yeah. work has been established that you can enter those, those spaces. There's certainly a moment in the visual art too, where it goes from lead or charcoal on a page to, oh, it's, it's this thing I was recreating. All of a sudden, it has that essence. I think it, I think it's all sort of the same. Yeah. Um, a follow up to you. So you said when a composer can do that well. Any any f composers you feel that you've sung that you feel can do that well. Like um, I know you've sung many many different roles, but yeah. Um, I see. There's lots of them. I mean, I, right now I am. I am absolutely in love with Strauss and I, I'd say I always have been but I've been revisiting and I think there's a certain musical language he uses that because of how my instrument is is shaped to to put things loosely because of where I feel I belong in the operatic world I do feel like my body responds to his musical language um, and there's something about the um, directness of the way he um, communicates and the the way in which the orchestra and the voice is, um, to me, equally important. I think, depending on the on the time frame you're we're, we're working within, there's moments when it really feels like voice and accompaniment. Um, to me, Strauss isn't that. I think it's all so integral, and and to me, that's a part of a team atmosphere too, and I love that. Um, so I I think he does that really well, and I think I also have an understanding for the German language that makes me feel like I can communicate well. Um, it's probably the most similar to English in the in the um, the language style, the way we emphasize words, the way we communicate with consonants and all of that makes a lot of sense to me just because of where I grew up and what I speak. Um, but I also I also think, I mean, you played Bohème. Puccini does an amazing job of of letting the voice have the room to really express and, and the push and pull of the orchestra and and the uh, just the dynamic collaboration that happens in that I think is also incredibly powerful. I mean, Mozart, Verdi, I, I, the greats, if you can name them, if it's a household name, you can probably guarantee that they're pretty good at this because this is what makes people feel things and makes them want to make this, make this again and again and again, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Dr. Lim, I know uh, you've done a, a lot of work in the area of, of music and creativity and have a lot of interest there. And I'd love to pull you into this conversation as well. Um, I, I'm wondering, um, the act of, of making something can often feel like playing, like playing with sound. Mm -hmm. And I, I was wondering, what is the role that improvisation plays in music? Um, can you tell us a little bit about what what happens in our brains when people improvise? Sure, let me try to. I, I really love what, what Jamie said there because I think that actually science has something to say about that. And it, it, it's, it speaks to me very directly in terms of some of the things we're finding in our research. But I think when we talk about improvisation, which is the spontaneous creation of novel material, it's probably worth looking at it not as just a specialized circumstance that happens in jazz clubs, but actually as a very normal part of human life, but also a normal part of musical life. And I think if we think about the history of music and how it began, probably the first music was actually improvised rather than memorized or composed because there really wasn't that kind of history to it. And I think that life itself, the way we live life tends to be largely improvised. Yes, we can schedule our day and things like that, but the, we are constantly reacting to unexpected changes in schedule or events that happen that force you to suddenly re respond in a novel, unexpected or unplanned way. So this is all a way to state that I think improvisation is a very important fundamental biological activity and it's something that we need to do to stay alive. Now in the musical domain, jazz, I think maybe more than any other musical art form has really taken improvisation, just put it front and center. I mean, it is essentially what you listen to jazz for is for the improvisation. And so in our research, we've been looking at highly trained jazz experts that are um, essentially improvising in a, a functional MRI brain scanner and then also playing things that are memorized. And we're really trying to understand what changes in their brains when they go from this kind of memorized, more rote type of state to a improvised, spontaneously creative kind of state. 
And we're actually seeing that large changes happen in the prefrontal cortex of the brain. Now, this is the part of the brain that, that's up here that really separates humans from animals. It's where um, self-consciousness resides. And what we're seeing is that in these large parts of prefrontal cortex, the brain is, appears to be relatively shutting itself off during spontaneous flow in the form of creative improvisation. Now, what does that mean? It might mean that in order to be highly creative, you have to shut off some of these conscious self-censoring mechanisms that are constantly limiting or questioning or restricting your ability to feel free. And maybe this is really the sort of scientific version of what Jamie was describing when she said that a lot of what they're trying to do while practicing is to get rid of layers and you know trying to get so that you feel free and in the version of neuroscientific uh, freedom might be that you're shutting off these self-censoring conscious monitoring mechanisms in your brain that are normally in place to filter what you do like right now these parts of our brain should be very active because we're trying to make sure that our output is very regulated carefully controlled and that what we say is accurate and meaningful and relevant but if you do too much self-control it might be hard to be free and it might be hard to come up with something that's unplanned. And so it seems that the improvising musician can do that very well, especially if they've been a trained jazz musician. They can kind of very quickly shut off these conscious self-monitoring parts of their brain in order to achieve a certain musical and um, neurologic freedom. And w would you say, is there a connection at all with this concept of flow um, when, when, they, when musicians enter that kind of um, shut off state? Um, where they're not sort of self, uh, like criticizing the thought or, um, or overthinking it. Um, is, is there a connection there? I think there is. Now, flow can happen whether you're creating music that's novel or not. So for example, a classical musician or an opera singer that is performing a piece that they've memorized can certainly enter a flow state. And I think in that flow state, as you described when driving, there's a certain automaticity to it. Things are easy, time goes away and that you lose your awareness of all of the millions of things you need to do to make that performance happen. So that can be true whether you're improvising or doing something that's memorized. And so there's classical versions of flow, just like there's jazz versions of flow. But I think in the brain, they're likely to be very similar. Now we haven't yet examined classical flow yet to the extent that we need to or would like to. Hopefully that's a study that we'll be able to do. And I do think that there will be a lot of similarities between what's happening when you reach a certain level of expertise and also a certain level of performance um, when you are really um, automated and things are, are just flowing effortlessly. But maybe the improvising version of musical performance is particularly good at putting people into that frame of mind. Now I have one technical question for you. So I've seen some of the work that you've done, um, and I, I've seen the, the the sort of contraption keyboard that that jazz musicians will have when they're in an MRI machine. Um, is there are there limitations? I'm sure there are limitations, but um, are there ways of say, for example, studying how other musicians that can't fit exactly into the machine as conveniently um, are? Will will it require uh, different types of, of technology for us to be able to to uncover that, or what what would be holding that that kind of study back? Yeah, there's a lot of technical constraints to studying real live musical production in an fMRI scanner. Now, an fMRI scanner is basically an MRI scanner that's outfitted to look at changes in blood oxygenation rather than just anatomy, and it is a big magnet. And so, because it's a big magnet, you cannot go in there with any magnetic metals. A lot of instruments have metallic parts in them that need to be changed. And so, for example, we were working with the great tabla player, uh, Zakir Hussain, recently. And one thing he did, which was really amazing, was there's iron dust that's in, in these tablas um, that are in, when they're built. And so he actually contacted somebody in India to basically reduce the amount of iron dust that was being used in the tabla so that he could bring it into the fMRI scanner. And so you often have to be very creative in how you come up with instrumentation to be used in the scanner. In the case of the piano, it's a 35 key plastic piano keyboard that's, you know, it, it's not acoustic, it's putting out electrical MIDI signals. And so you have to work around it. Microphones can be useful. So we've actually, actually Renee Fleming was kind enough to do a, an fMRI scan for part of the Sound Health Network uh, work, uh, projects that we did at the uh, Kennedy Center. And we can record the voice fairly well. There's some serious head movement limitations 
And then beyond fMRI, there's other methods of looking at brain activity, whether it's EEG or you know fNIRs. So there's a lot of ways PET scanning. There's ways to look at the brain that don't necessarily have the same spatial physical constraints that fMRI does. But fMRI is a pretty powerful way of looking at almost any natural biological activity while it's happening. Amazing, amazing stuff. Um, I'd love to that, hear that room, that that uh, hospital room with incredible sounds happening um, and also the brain being studied. It's amazing. Um, we are going to move to uh, a, a little bit of a Q&A just in a moment, but I, I wanted to ask one last question before we do so. And um, Dr. Black, I, I wonder if I could ask you this. Um, for those of us who see ourselves as music appreciators, and I'm sure that's kind of all of us, even all of us on this on this uh, talk right now, what are what are some general benefits of music in our lives? Oh, that's lovely. That's such a lovely question. I think um, I think when someone asks that question of themselves, it's helpful to look at the history of what music has been used for in one's life. So if I said to you, Ian, like, what are the general benefits of music in your life? I would then kind of ask you to go back and look at your childhood, at your teenage years. And as different events happen to us in our lives, music accompanies us. It's like this friend that's with us all the way through. And it doesn't judge, it doesn't criticize, it just keeps showing up. Uh, whether it's a meaningful event like um, like a wedding or a celebration or a more challenging life event like the death of someone we love, there tends to be music that underscores every part of our lives. So I think really looking at one's own life, putting up a mirror to ourselves and asking what role has music played? And from that place, springboarding off and saying, okay, I use music when I'm feeling joyful. I use music when I'm feeling overwhelmed and sad. I use music to connect with other people. I love going to concerts. Um, so again, it's it's highly individual, but I think social connection and then intrapersonal connection, connecting to our own experiences are two very powerful benefits. We can connect to others through music. And you know, given the time that we're in in this pandemic, that has been an increasingly difficult challenge. But traditionally, attending the opera, when you are there in an experience with, again, hundreds of other people, um, but also you're having an experience with yourself and that will carry forward through whatever life brings you. You will always remember when you saw Bohem for the first time, or you'll always remember when you saw that very, very special performance. So recognizing that music connects us to others, music connects us to ourselves, uh, but never underestimating the power of music is also really important. Uh, I could go into kind of different facets of the human experience and how music impacts different areas, but at the end of the day, it is, it's highly individual and it's also limitless. Mm -hmm. So encouraging people to recognize that they have their own beautiful personal connection to music and to tap into that. So in times of challenge, in times of joy, um, always holding close that idea that music has limitless ability, capability, things we don't even know yet, but each person has their own beautiful, unique relationship to it. I think actually after having heard your response, I like music more if <laughs> if that was possible. It, it is incredible after just spending this last hour and a bit uh, with all of you to think about the myriad ways that music is is uh, affecting our brain that we don't even understand, I'm sure, um, and the the benefits and the connection to memory, the connection to other humans, the connection to self. Um, it is it is a, a, an incredible thing, um, and and I'd like to to open it up now to hear from some of the folks that have been participating or watching uh, on YouTube. Um, so this is the Q and A section of our of our evening. If you haven't already had a chance to ask a question, please please do so in the comment box on YouTube, and um, we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. So. I am going to look at the first one here. Uh, this is for Dr. Uh, well, Dr. Swiminathan. I wonder if you might be able to take this one. Uh, Sharifa asks, uh, does volume, so if a song is played louder or quieter, have any um, uh, affect in our enjoyment of a song? And there's a follow-up. Uh, do we have to already enjoy or dislike the song in order to notice the influence of volume? Um. I mean, 
in general, uh, volume as a cue for any sort of auditory si signal. So it could be laughter, it could be sort of a scream, it could be you know, speech, or it could be uh, loud music. Uh, volume tends to be related to uh, sort of uh, certain emotions that are, you know, it could communicate anger, it could communicate uh, things like, uh, yeah, especially anger. You know, it's it's very high arousal uh, sort of emotion, uh, and I, and it's not particularly uh, related to music as such, but across all auditory signals. Um, I think the second uh, part of that question had to do with if the the volume changed uh, during the song, uh, and whether you would notice if uh, it uh, yeah. It was, uh, it was it, whether or not we had to already enjoy or dislike the song in order to notice the influence of volume. I mean, uh, given that, uh, I, you know, volume is sort of a more basic auditory cue, I would think that uh, it would have an effect whether you liked the song already or you didn't already like it. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Lim, I have a question for you. Uh, Culture Shift is interested in hearing from you about how music is processed uh, if a person doesn't hear. Oh, I'm having a little bit of difficulty hearing you. Uh, that's oh. a very interesting question, thank you. Um, yeah. Now, so uh, in my clinical practice as an ear specialist, I treat a lot of people that have hearing loss. And he hearing loss is um, it's not usually a binary thing. There's different degrees of it, you know, mild hearing loss to severe hearing loss to profound deafness. And each stage of that kind of hearing loss has a certain implication on the filtration of the sound that's coming in. And so if you think about somebody who has a significant hearing loss, they basically have lost the ability to perceive certain frequencies of sound at a proper volume or that there's a certain distortion or lack of synchronization in the sound that they are hearing. So the actual physical stimulus gets basically mangled. And by the time it gets to their brain, it's a poor reflection of what they originally were supposed to be hearing. Now, in the case of somebody who's deaf, uh, who's either, let's just say the case of somebody who's never heard sound before, um, it's actually rather difficult to, uh, to conceive of what it might mean for them to have a musical experience. Now, a lot of that seems to be vibrotactile and this might be also pertinent to the last question about really loud live music is that there's mm -hmm. low frequencies can transmit to your body and you feel it, the, the thump in your chest from bass is not just auditory, it's actually partially physical because you're hearing, you're feeling the actual um, low frequency vibrations. Now, cochlear implantation is a technology that we use to try to restore hearing in people who have lost it. And in, the, in that situation, what we're doing is putting a small electrode into the inner ear that is trying to stimulate the auditory nerve in a frequency appropriate way. It's not a powerful enough device to do that task with the specificity required for music. And so what happens is that you have a, a crude version or an impoverished version of music, but still an experience that can be quite musical. And so there are a number of cochlear implant patients out there that are able to hear um, and play music at a very high level, even though they're actually deaf and they're using cochlear implants. If you've lost your hearing later in life, your brain still retains auditory memories and auditory processing areas are still there. So even if you're deaf, you can have a musical experience or a memory in the same way that Beethoven was able to compose when he had profound hearing loss or the way that we can play in our heads one of our favorite songs without actually hearing it because our auditory centers are still there. If you've never had sound and you've never had any implants or anything like that, probably what happens ultimately is that your auditory cortical processing areas will get used for to subserve other things such as visual processing in a way to um, help your brain utilize as much neural tissue as it has to process whatever information it can get. Incredible, incredible. Um, okay, let's take another one here. Uh, for, for Dr. Black, uh, Jocelyn uh, Kay asks, um, uh, sorry here, uh, what ways can I use music to help my healing journey as a cancer warrior? Are there ways besides just listening to music? Thank you, Jocelyn, for the question and for uh, inviting us into a, a window of your experience. So absolutely, I think um, beyond listening to music, something I often do with individuals 
is something called lyric analysis because music affects us not just in the in the sound production of it, but also often in the lyrics or perhaps in the associations with certain performances that we may have experienced. But I would encourage you to perhaps connect with music that has held meaning to you in times of, we well, use the word warrior and I think of triumph and I think of, of uh, perseverance and I think of all these very powerful words of resilience. So are there lyrics to songs that resonate with you that tap into these feelings or this sense of resilience? And perhaps I, I often um, encourage people to use these lyrics as mantras in times of difficulty or if they're anticipating a difficult event, what lyrics can you carry with you into that operating room, into that chemo chair, into that radiation treatment. Um, so that's just one idea that comes to mind when I think about uh, beyond listening, that lyrics are a big part of it. Musical production. I mean, I, I believe so wholeheartedly that every human being is musical and whether you have training or not does not impact your inherent musicality as a human being. So regardless of whether you've taken a lifetime of piano lessons or have never touched an instrument or sung a note in your life, you have inside you this inherent sense of music because as I referred to earlier, the body itself moves through the world rhythmically. We speak, our prosody is musical. Um, so I encourage people to sing. I encourage people to hum. I encourage people to take deep, meaningful breaths. I think all of this connects back to a sense of musicality. When we invite music into and out of our bodies, um, we invite our bodies to experience, perhaps like Jamie said so articulately, um, shedding these layers, like letting go of layers and coming to the core of an experience. So, you know, the classic singing in the shower, singing in the car, humming to oneself, these actually have profound impacts on our emotional state and on our physical state. So maybe it's um, picking up an instrument you haven't played for a while. Maybe it's taking piano lessons. Maybe it's just quietly humming to yourself and just feeling where that lands. So just these two brief examples come to mind beyond listening. There is production and then tapping into different elements of music like lyrics. So a couple of options there. Excellent. Thank you. Jamie, I have one for you. Um, this is interesting. You've, you've performed for lots of babies uh, as part of the Opera for Babies program. Um, just the, the, uh, the person asking the question is curious to know uh, about babies' responses. And do you notice any trends when singing in that environment rather than singing in, in uh, maybe an adult environment? Sure. I mean, I think one of the, one of the most amazing experiences is just unfiltered audience response. <laughs> I think we're, we're all kind of trained that when we're in the recital hall or we're in the auditorium, that we are meant to keep quiet and listen nicely and all of those things. But I think there's a certain freedom in, in a, a child's perspective on how they how they experience music. I also, I mean, it was COVID and, and not a whole lot of performing to do over the summer. And so I spent a lot of time nannying and and we sing all the time. That's 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 a, a favorite activity and and they're excited to do it and they're not they're not shy. They're not um, we talked about those layers lots of times and, and they don't have so many yet. And I think there's something really profound about letting them experience it however they like, whether it's walking underneath, we, we, we go on a regular walk and we walk underneath a, a train bridge and it echoes in there. And if they can sing as loud as they possibly can, they're thrilled. Um, and I think that, I think those sort of experiences are really important. We've talked a lot about how music is, is, um, a big part of memories and how um, how that can inform your experience of music for the rest of your life. Um, and I think that being able to provide musical memories, even if it's even if it's so small, I mean, you know, a baby isn't going to remember this experience when they're grown, but perhaps perhaps a repeated experience of having this sort of innate interaction with music and have that be a part of the foundations of who they are. Perhaps that's incredibly important. Um, as I said, like one of my favorite memories is my mom singing to me as a kid. It, it, it's a part of it's a part of a, a loving relationship to me. It's a part of so many things, and I think that to be a part of that in young children is is very powerful for me because 
I feel like I, I can have an effect in a different way, in a, in a less, um, less structured way, a less um, communication driven. Honestly, it's, it's not so much that it's, it's more about just being in the room together and it being the experience that it is, whatever that might be. I don't know if that answers the question, but. That's brilliant. Yep. Yeah, that's great. Um, just a couple more before we end our time. Um, Adam asks uh, if each of you could share one of your personal favorite pieces of music uh, and maybe why does it mean so much to you? And I guess we can keep this open to any style of music. Uh, who wants to go first? I'll go. Okay, let's hear it. You know, I, I was thinking about this because I was talking about my to my wife, and she was asking me what what song do I wish I had ever written or composed, and and I went through a number of things, but actually I came down with Prince, uh, the beautiful ones, which is a track I think it's the third track in uh, Purple Rain, and the reason why uh, I, I like that song so much, but particularly the recording, the performance, is that. It, you really he's he's essentially screaming by the end of the song but it's the most beautiful screaming you've ever heard and i just, to me it's there's some genius in that oh it's a tricky one there's so many <laughs> <laughs> it's the impossible question to ask music it's, lovers right oh no <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm, I'm even blanking. I'm going ah <laughs> to grab a question, All right, a piece. Well, I'm, okay, I'm gonna give this a try. I have a lot of favorite pieces, but uh, I listened to something yesterday, so that's fresh in my mind. So that's what is going to be my favorite piece today. Um, this is uh, Pandit Jasraj is a rendition of Raga J J Vanti. Uh, I'm not sure which year, but uh, it was it, it was in a concert, and it's uh, so much of uh, North Indian classical music is completely improvised. So it's 30 to 40 minutes of complete improvisation, and it's it's just a beautiful raga that's sung, uh, you know, really late in the evening. It's called Jai Jai Vanti, and uh, he's in 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 sort of this uh in the zone just this flow state as dr lim was mentioning uh and he's you know it starts off really uh slow as is usually the format in uh, north indian classical music and then it picks up to a really fast pace towards the end and uh he just gets everything right and it's so beautiful and it's so sublime beautiful beautiful it's interesting to me. I I'll, I keep on I keep on thinking about how integrated my experience of performing music is with my listening of it. I I, I immediately went to oh, what's my favorite song to sing? And I think that's that's a challenge for for someone in my profession because listening it ends up being hard because you you think about it different. Uh, I think my favorite is probably um, Liu's second aria from Turandot. Um, I think it's just one of the most powerful moments. And I think it expresses the emotions so clearly in in the, the colors that Puccini creates. And I don't know, I, I, I just, I, I have like an innate response to it that is very self-indulgent and I love it. <laughs> Dr. Black, do you have a, a, a contender for the list? Well, I was thinking about what Jamie said and it, um, it resonated with me because as I've been in the music therapy field for a number of years, songs become highly associative with patients and with their experiences. Um, so it's interesting thinking about my favorite songs and then some of the songs that I've experienced in, in very tender, very difficult moments with patients. But um, the Rolling Stones, Wild Horses came to mind and I couldn't shake it. And I thought maybe that's it. And I adore it. I adore singing it, I adore listening to the original version and covers of it, but um, as I was, you know, trying so hard to come up with the right answer, Beethoven's Ninth, the entire thing, I just, I get chills just thinking about it, and I can't help but connect to performances I've attended, and moments that have just made me just so tingly with um, joy and uh, 
just feeling ecstatic listening to it. So those are my two, Beethoven's Ninth and Wild Horses by the Stone. Beautiful. I love the diversity of our responses. And for mine, I would say maybe, it, and again, it's associated with a memory from being a, a young child and being eye-opened to uh, to opera. I'd say Peter Grimes by Benjamin Britten. Oh it's such a, such a formative piece of music in my life. Well. I, there are more questions and we could talk uh, forever really about these things. And in some ways I feel like we've just done the superficial gloss of many areas that you all have gone so deeply in both in your research, in your, in your study, in your practice. Um, but I do wanna thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, my guests tonight were Jamie Groot, Dr. Sarah Rose Black, Dr. Charles Lim and Dr. Swati, Swaminathan, sorry about that. Um, wonderful having you all. Thank you so much for joining us for this first evening in this COC in Conversation uh, event. Um, I want to say to anybody that's watching, if, if uh, you are new to the COC and you enjoyed tonight's discussion, you can sign up uh, to hear more uh, of, uh, to hear about more events just like this one, uh, you can head over to coc.ca slash eopera for more information. And we would love to welcome you back for more of these free conversations. Uh, also, just to point out a couple of things that are coming up, um, the COC is launching a new podcast called Key Change. And there's also a new in-depth video series featuring the COC Orchestra. And as well, at the end of, uh, or later in November, um, there is a free three-day digital festival featuring performances by dozens of artists. Again, everything here is part of Opera Everywhere, the company's reimagined season, which uh, you can learn about uh, at coc.ca. Thank you all, thank you to my guests, and thank you everyone for tuning in. Have a wonderful evening. <laughs>